You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. We have seen a period since 1900 of war. The 20th century was a period of chaos, plunging the world into World War I and II and over 36 wars, according to Britannica. This century we're in today, the 21st century, has been probably just as deadly, with eight deadly conflicts, conflicts according to Britannica. And here's a graph of the wars or conflicts that have been fought since the Second World War. Apparently, over 90 conflicts have been fought worldwide since that time. So we live in a time of utter chaos, when things are not really very safe. And up in Russia, there is this gentleman, Vladimir Putin. And okay, this is quite some time ago, but he stated, apparently that he had a new plan for world domination. And that has been his desire for a long time. And if he doesn't achieve it, certainly the leader that follows him will, as the scripture shows. So what do we see? Well, Russia has been preparing for war for a long time. It has been preparing for war and is now acting. Let's come back a little Russia prepares for war. Every year, there's the annual Red Square Victory Parade. And here's one maybe 10 years ago. And it has continued year by year. Here's the headlines in a British paper. Russia is actively preparing for war in Europe. And here we can see. And look at the date of that. So Russia, since that time, the first picture, right through to this time, has been preparing for war and has continued to do so. Here's 2020. Look at the Red Square Parade that year. The escalation of weaponry is huge. This is only a little touch of what he's done. In Russia, all the young people, since they passed 17, amongst the men are called up for six months, if not longer, into the army. So they are well trained to some degree. Those who stay on are a huge army. They reckon about two million. So it's a huge number that they've been developing there in Russia at this time. But where things are going? We'll look back over the last two years, all right? 2001, 2002. Look what's happened. Russia's been into Belarus and Belarus has fallen. We'll look at that in a second. They have exercised the Zapad military exercise, which they do every 30 or 40 years. We'll look at that in a second. They have now gone into Ukraine. And now, they're attempting to crush Europe by limiting the amount of gas, oil and food supplies. And we'll look at that in some detail in a moment. And now, Russia is threatening to take Ukraine, then Europe, and I believe the Middle East. Well... Here we are, back 2002. And here's Putin shaking hands with the leader of Belarus. Finally he capitulated. The threat of war in the area of Belarus, they just gave up eventually. Gave up. Soft annexation inside the Russian takeover of Belarus. The Kremlin is achieving its strategic goals. Here's one of them. Belarus is stealthily, stealthily and steadily methodical in the occupation of Belarus. And so here's Belarus, taken over by Russia. Belarus has now fallen under the influence of Russia. Now listen to this, gentlemen. Belarus president says, don't worry, the whole continent of Europe is on the verge of war. It's only the beginning, he says, you wait. I can see what's going to happen. That's why we gave up. Well, it was sensible. We wasn't losing people. Shortly after that, Russia held the biggest military exercise in Europe for 40 years. Look at the date. September, almost a year, just a year and a month ago. 
This was a huge economic movement, to, uh, a military movement. 200,000 troops from Russia, 290 tanks, 230 artillery pieces were moved there to the borders of Europe, threatening Europe. The largest exercise by Russia in 40 years. Amazing. And then, now they're threatening to take Ukraine. Here we've got a cartoon, really, from way back, 1991, when the Iron Curtain came down and they lost Ukraine and much of Eastern Europe. And here, Russia is saying, we're going to gobble you back up. The beginning will be Ukraine. You wait. And so here we have a more modern picture, a cartoon picture of only a little while ago, and Ukraine's in its mouth. It's only a little while away before the occupation of Europe, and that's their plan. So how's it to be achieved? Well, February this year, they moved. Russia crosses the line. Here's the front page of the Australian on that day. And in they moved. Moved into that area dramatically. Oh, they didn't succeed so well as they thought. They thought it'd be over in a blink. But it wasn't quite the way they thought. But it's going to fall. And we'll see that in a minute. Here's the next day. Here's children hiding in cellars in Kiev, the capital, fearing what's going to happen as the bombings are going on. The blitz to wipe out Ukraine off the map. Speeding movements are endeavoured to happen. And here's the people in Ukraine. What are they doing? Look, there's the, that streets are hardly filled. But look at this one. They're fleeing. People are trying to get out of Ukraine. They can see what's going to happen. Echoes of World War II. Thousands are fleeing Ukraine. What a terrifying situation. And that's day two. And so we can see the fear of World War II is coming, and that's how the Australians saw that. Oh, yes, it's gone backward a little, but it's going to go forward, and we'll see a bit more of it. In Ukraine, population about 40 or 50 million. Seven million have already fled. Women and children under the age, I think it's 17, and they're allowed to go. Nobody else. So they're going to the borders and getting out in bigger and bigger and bigger numbers because they can see what's coming. By their very action, it shows how they think things will move in the very near future. So how will Russia get control of Europe? Well, we're not precisely told in Scripture, but we're going to look at some of the events that are taking place at the moment in order to have a bit of an idea of what's going on. Russia's invasion of Europe, Ukraine and Europe is a threat to world fuel, gas and food supplies. They're using that as a weapon to get control of Europe. You know, Europe's in a difficult position this last year. Europe experienced, according to the papers, the worst drought in 500 years. Europe... So they're short of food. And they're going to need fertilisers and such like. And they're now facing winter. Things are looking very, very difficult for Europe. Here's what Mr Putin aims to use. Control of gas and petrol, fuel, oil. Gazprom cuts daily transit by Ukraine to the two-year low. Oh yes, it's the start of this year. But they're creating a shortage, which will be dramatically seen in the cold period. You know, you stop and pause and think about Russia during the Second World War. Go back in your mind for a moment. Russia defeated some degree Germany. How did they do it? Germany came up with all their tanks, and their tanks froze. They couldn't start them in the morning. They light a fire under them to get the motors moving. And they often blow up. The men would come out of the tanks and they didn't have clothing enough for winter. The Germans lost terribly huge numbers of men and equipment in Russia during the Second World War. 
Who won that bit for Russia? They say, General Winter. And it looks like Mr Putin is going to use that now. Turn off the gas. Here's some of the pipelines, many of which go through Ukraine into Europe. But it's not just those. Look, Russia's bought two, built two pipes, lines, Nordic 1 and 2, to Europe, to Germany. There are the pipelines going through Ukraine, but others are going through France, uh, through Poland. They're cutting them off one by one by one. And now, Germany's in a terrible situation. They're trying to accumulate gas at the rate, the maximum possible, and put them in their cylinders. Yes, they've got plenty, but when winter comes, it looks like they'll get no more. And so things are looking very serious. Look at this situation. That pipeline has been cut twice, both pipelines. And now, Russia can now cut the gas pipelines to Europe through Poland and through Ukraine, further than this one. It's only a moment, and winter's going to come. It's going to freeze. Putin sent a video to all of the leaders of Europe, a video of what winter will be like, how cold it will be like without their gas, without their oil. The situation is looking very desperate. And at one point, gas prices, even before this year, soared to two, 600%. We're going to get higher gas prices here, but nothing like over in Europe. They're going to be desperate. And the winter over there is a whole lot colder than here. What's going to happen? Well, now Ukraine is in trouble. Oh, yes, there's gas pipelines going through Ukraine and they're working. But Russia only needs to wait for winter to cut them. And further to that, they've got a new commander in the military in Ukraine. There he is. They've given him a special name. He actually came from Syria. He conquered Syria, who was a brutal general down there, and conquered Syria on the borders of Israel. They brought him back up, and immediately he sent drones into Ukraine, and they blew up power station after power station in Ukraine. Here we are, General Armageddon, now in charge of Russia's war. There he is. Gentle, nice-looking man, isn't he? Commander of the attack of Ukraine described as absolutely ruthless with little regard for human life. He's commanding the forces facing now Ukraine. And the consequence? Just within the first 10 days of his command, he destroyed 30% of the power plants in eight days. They destroyed 1,100 power points. In Australia, we have one big power station per you know, every big area, and when they have power cables going across to them. Not there. Every little town has its own power station, supplying each separate town. 1,100 of them were destroyed just within 10 days. The capacity to wipe the rest out is there. So here's some of those that were wiped out, and here's the consequences. Terrible. Terrible. And winter's coming. It's not going to be easy. For Ukraine. And now, the threat is he will destroy one of their big hydropower systems. Apparently, down along this hydropower si power station, which is in Russian hands, they put explosive down along their there. So it seems like with a press of a button, this or that same thing could be blown up. And huge quantities of electricity cut off in a moment. What would you do? You think of living in Ukraine, which is a cold, cold city. Cold, cold country. And further to that, Russia threatens to revive old nuclear fears in Central Europe. They're saying, we could drop our dirty bomb on you. Not a big one, but a dirty bomb. Could wipe out much of Ukraine if we like. What a fear. What a fear for the area of Ukraine. But now, remember I told you that if they cut off that gas and that oil, it'll be terribly cold for winter. But now, look at the date. Yesterday, or the day before, Russia halts Iranian Black Sea grain exports, citing an attack on Crimea. They said, listen, 
Ukraine, you attack the area over here in Crimea, we're going to get you. We're stopping all the grain going out through here into the Mediterranean, into Europe and into Africa. Remember, Europe has experienced the biggest drought in 500 years. They're short, short on food. Where can they get it? Well, the exported grain into the world system coming from this area is about 40% of the world's supplies that is exported by ship. Huge quantities. And Europe could be completely cut off in a moment. And areas like Egypt and Africa too, cut back dramatically. Russia says, we will stop that grain going out. We will stop it. And there we are. The United Nations brokered grain deal is crucial for the foods market. It allows the export of grain from Ukraine, one of the world's largest exporters, uh, that, that the U uh, Russian invasion had halted. So much came from Russia and much came from Ukraine <coughs> together. Huge quantities. And now they're threatening to cut off both of those areas coming out through here. So it's really looking quite critical. And incidentally, while we've actually got this map, Russia moved troops into this area here, actually the area of Armenia, only a couple of months ago. And through Armenia goes pipelines of oil from the Caspian Sea, which is over here on my right, through into Greece and Italy. Those about four pipelines, and they could cut them off too in a moment. So Europe is in a terribly invidious position. The only way they can do it, raise their hands, be friendly to Russia. Well, why Russia has invaded Ukraine and what does Putin want? Listen to, uh, to Mr. Schultz, the leader of Germany. Germany, Schultz believes Putin wants to build a Russian empire. That was our title. In line with his own vision, that's his aim. With all this problem that's going on in Ukraine and the oil and gas going into Europe. So, how will this end? How will this chaos end? World War, as our title said, and Christ's return, thank goodness. That's how it's going to end. You see, Joel, chapter 3, and most of the PowerPoints or the quotes I've got up on the PowerPoint here, God says, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and part of my land. He says, when Israel's come back to that land, there's going to come a time when all nations are involved coming into the Middle East in a time of war. Time of world war. Revelation 16, verses 14 to 16 says this, the kings of the earth and of the whole world will be gathered to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. And he, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Armageddon. And so here is the great battle that shall be fought in the Middle East. So there we are, world war is what the scripture predicts. But then after that, come back a moment, Christ's return, look, 318 times in the New Testament alone, it speaks to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. Christ's return, the great promise of the Bible. So thank goodness, that conflict is going to come to an end with the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will rule this earth. But now, the burning question for us, can you rely upon the Bible? Well, let's go aside just for a little while. You see, signs that show Christ's coming is near. Just take these for a minute. I want to pick up two of them. The first one is that Israel will become a nation in the land of Israel, just before Christ's return. Joel seemed to suggest that when I read Joel chapter 1, verse 2, only a few moments ago. But let's have a look at that. Come back in history a bit. Many years ago, Ezekiel, writing, said this, in Ezekiel chapter 37, one chapter before what we read, 
He said just before Ezekiel 38, when Russia comes into the Middle East, as we'll see, he says, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'll take the children of Israel from among the heathen and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Can we rely on the Bible? That's what he said he'd do. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. Yes. And one king shall be king to them all. That's Christ. So we've seen the first three steps somewhat fulfilled. It's sure and certain. When it was stated many years ago in the days of Ezekiel, look what they said. Jeremiah said this. Thus said the Lord, which giveth the sun for light by day and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, if those ordinances depart from before me, sun and moon disappear, he says, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. It's as sure as the sun is in the sky and the moon and it rises every day or night. Sure as that, he says, Israel will return. So one of our writers many years ago, back in 1848, wrote this. There is then a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before Christ's appearing into the kingdom. There the Jewish colonisation of Palestine will be on political principles and they will return in unbelief of Jesus. That's what they've done. And they will immigrate thither as agriculturists and traders and that's what they've done. Exactly as he said. In return they come. And in 1948, June the 14th, the state of Israel was proclaimed. And ladies and gentlemen, think about it. God said this, Jewry, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that ye may know, that's all of us may know, and believe me and understand that I am he, before me there is no God formed. As sure as Israel returns, we know there is a God and that he is causing the scriptures to be written. So can we trust the Bible? The Jews are the witnesses that it's true. Well, let's come to another event. We expect Russia as a superpower. And that's what we're going to consider, or what we're considering tonight. The return of Russia to the land of Israel. Where in the Bible is Russia referred to? Well, it's referred to quite a few times directly or by allusion. We looked at Ezekiel 38. You've got it still before you on your knees in your Bible. Verse 2, it says, Gog. The word Gog means the supreme leader, the one at the top of the land of Magog. That is the area of Ukraine and Central Europe. We'll look at this in a minute and prove that to be so. And the chief, the Hebrew word there, chief, is Rosh, from which we get the word Russia. The prince of Meshach, the Moscow area. And Tubal, the area of Tobolsky. And prophesy against him. So here is one who's to be the supreme leader of the area of Russia and Central Europe. More on that in a second. So that's what we expect from Ezekiel 38. Let's prove that conclusively. You see, the Bible says to us, Russia is referred to in quite a few quotes, most directly in Ezekiel 38. But it's referred to there in those quotes. Daniel 2, Daniel 11, Ezekiel 38, Joel 3, Zechariah 14, Revelation 16. Well, let's look further. The writer that we talked about before who expected the Jews to return to the land in the same book, Elpis Israel, wrote way back there in 1848. In the preface of that book, right at the start he says, the future movements of Russia are notable signs of the times because they're predicted in the, in the scriptures of truth. It's sure, it's certain. When Russia makes its grand move, and we're seeing that now, for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader, that's us, know that the end of all things as at present constituted is at hand. He was right in regard to Israel. He looks to be absolutely right in regard to Russia. And if that's true, the end of all things is near at hand and we need to be very serious about the Bible and about what we're doing. Well, let's move on. Come back to Ezekiel 38. 
verse 2. It says there, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now I want to look at that word there, chief, for a minute. We said to it, it's the Hebrew word rosh. And it's rendered by almost every modern version as rosh. There it is, rosh. It should be rosh. If it isn't, if you haven't got it in your Bible, maybe put a little pencil note beside it. But that word there, chief, is the Hebrew word rosh. It's a proper noun. And so he goes on. Or so we can go on. Let's now look at history. Or in fact, in this case, a lexicon. Jesenius, which is considered the leading Hebrew English lexicon in the world. It's like a, bi a dictionary of the Hebrew language as is recorded in the Bible. And there under the Hebrew word rosh, used in Ezekiel 38 verse 2, 3 and 39 verse 1, he says this, it is undoubtedly the Russians. Undoubtedly the Russians. So the evidence we have before us <clears throat> is substantial there. But let's not just look at a lexicon or a Bible dictionary of the Hebrew language. Look now at a geography book. Here we are in Bocart's Falege. It says, talking about Rosh now, and I'll put it on the map where the region of Rosh is, it is credible that from Rosh and Meshach, that is Roshai and Mothgai, of whom Ezekiel speaks, here we are, Ezekiel 38, descended the Russians and the Muscovites, nation of the greatest celebrity in the European Scythia. Ross is the most ancient form under which history makes mention of the name Russia. So here we can see, again, substantial evidence from writers who wrote in those days. We could go to other references, re Rosh. But let's now move to the word Magog. Here, take the map off the web, there it is, Magog. What evidence do we have that Magog is that region there? The Son of Man, says Ezekiel 38 verse 2 in the RV version, set thy face towards Gog of the land of Magog, prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now the historians, or one particular historian, but many support this, Historian living in the time of Christ said, Herodotus, the most ancient Greek writer stated, Scythia, which is that area there, or Mago, was a name given to the Greeks, by the Greeks, to an ancient and widely extended people who spread from the river Don westward along the banks of the Danube. Ah. So between the Don and the Danube, there's the Don, there's the Danube, so here's Rosh, uh, here's Magog today. It's that area there of southern Russia, Ukraine, and Germany somewhat. So there we are. That area's got to come under the Russian control, according to Scripture, and it will be right. So indeed, it is very exciting to see what's happening, how the Scripture is being fulfilled before our eyes. So summarising what we've seen so far, Gog of the land of Magog, Here's Mago. Prince of Rosh. Here's Meshech, the area of Moscow. Tubal, the area around Tobolsk and Goma, which is the area of more Paris, France, in that area there. So almost all of Europe, exclude Britain, will be united with Russia, ultimately, says the scripture. An amazing statement for us to see. And here we're at the edge of that move. What's going to happen this winter? The situation is laid out for us very clearly. But notice, son of man, set thy face against Gog. Remember that word Gog means a supreme leader. So what are we expecting? The one at the top, the supreme leader, the emperor. is the basic meaning of that word Gog. So who is this? Well, we don't know for sure. But at the moment, it's probably or possibly Putin. It does say in the scripture, Gog of Magog, and it could be southern Russia or even coming from the area of Ukraine. But one thing's for sure at the moment, it certainly looks like this chappy here. All right, so there we can see what's going on at the moment. But how does the leader of Ukraine see this? Here we are, Ukraine's President Zelensky says, 
the answer of what's going to happen is there's a big war in Europe. It's not going to stop with us in Ukraine. That's what we suggested from Scripture. That's what it looks like. Russia gets control of all of Europe. It lost Eastern Europe back in 1989, there about through to 1991. See, Iron Curtain came down and wants it back again. Zelensky warned them of what would become the start of a big war on the European continent, first of all. The whole world is saying this can happen any day now. So the situation looks very frightening. But it may not be a war necessarily. Here is Schultz, the leader of Germany, Macron, the leader of France. They're talking together. Oh yes, it's a month or two ago, but Germany's new resolve on Russia is already flagging. They can see winter coming. They can see the problems coming. Berlin with Paris may meet Moscow's snatch victory may yet help Moscow snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. In other words, they're looking like compromising. Saying, we don't want winter without the heat. We don't want our factories to close because we can't get enough gas, enough oil. And they're looking like giving up. Schultz teams up with the French President Macron, who has been pushing for an end to the war at terms favourable enough for Putin. He's saying, let's give up. The Italians agree. The Romanians agree. So the situation in a moment could change. We don't know when it's going to happen. But one thing's for sure. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, saw all the empires united together, the territory under Russia, and the last was the feet. And the feet was Europe the territory of the ten toes. And so what Europe lost in 1989 through to 1991 will be retaken. Look what the Bible says. I will turn thee back. He says, I'll bring thee back. And then I'll put hooks in their jaws and I'll bring thee forth, all thine army. So what they lost way back in 1989, 1991, 92, they'll get back again and Europe will be under their control. So Russia will invade Turkey and then Israel. Ezekiel 38 says, I will bring thee forth and all thine army, pass through the region of Tagama, just north of Turkey, and the king of the north, Russia, in Daniel 11, shall come against the land of Israel. Let's look at what that says. Russia will come, says Ezekiel 38, verse 15, out of the north part, RSV says, out of the uttermost parts of the north as a mighty army. So here we can see it. Here's the uttermost parts of the north, as Ezekiel 38 says, verse 15, in the RSV. And they will come into the Middle East. And they are preparing to do that. And when they do, where will they go first? Daniel 11 says the king of the north will come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and many ships and shall enter also into the glorious land and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So they'll go first of all into Egypt with many ships and by land. They will take Egypt. Why? Well, Egypt has found a massive gas field off the coast of Egypt. They found it about the same time as Israel, but it's taken them years to develop it. And they've just developed it. Last year, they got a balance of payments from a, of 50 billion profit in Egypt. Normally, they have a deficit, but they're prospering greatly. The amount of gas they're getting from here, making it an LPG and sending it to Europe, here's the ships. It's a real threat to what Russia's doing. And if Russia wishes to control the energy, they probably need to get Egypt first. They probably need to get Egypt first. The situation is looking very precarious. And so they will come. They will move in, take control of Europe, occupy Turkey, and then invade Israel. But first, in between, probably, they take Egypt. So here's their plan. Did this map probably two years ago, into Europe, into Ukraine, then into the Middle East, 
and then into the Israel and Egypt and back to Israel for the great battle of Armageddon. The situation is looking terribly scary at the moment. So things are looking like in that area first it will fall and then the whole of Europe. But remember what we said at the outset. There are a number of quotes that speak of Russia. Russia making its move into the Middle East. And those quotes show to us where, when, why and who. Let's look at the where question. Where will they come to? He shall come into the glorious land, says Daniel 11. The valley of Jehoshaphat, just outside Jerusalem. Upon the mountains of Israel, against Jerusalem to battle. So yes, he goes down into Egypt, but comes back to Jerusalem. So the great battle will occur in the Middle East in Israel. What about when? Well, at the time of the end, when I shall bring again Russia in. In many regards, they came in 1967 and armed the Egyptians. They were arming ships, but they didn't get them down in time in 1967. And I, in latter years, our days, after Jerusalem becomes a burden of stone, and everybody is worried about Israel and Jerusalem today, there's real strife and riots going on. It's exactly fulfilment of our time. So the great battle occurs at the time of the end in the near future. The day is just around the corner for all of us. We need to act. The time is short. The time is very short. Why? Why will Russia move into the Middle East and possibly Europe at that time? At that time, thy people will be delivered. Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Israel in Zion. That the nations may know me when thou, uh, when through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes and the Yahweh will be king over all the earth. So what's going to happen? The great battle will result in world coming under Christ's control. That's why Christ will intervene in that great conflict. And lastly, who? Who will come into the Middle East? Kings of the north with many ships. All the heathen, all the surrounding nations. Gog's confederacy, as we looked at in Ezekiel 38. Gather all nations to the land of Israel. It will be a worldwide conflict. All nations will be involved. It will be a frightening scene that we see at that time. So, when Christ descended into heaven, he went from the Mount of Olives and when he returns with the believers, he will return to the Mount of Olives. Now, Ezekiel 38, which we had read to us only a few little while ago, right at the start, look at what it says in verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel. Oh yes, that's what we looked at. Saith the Lord God, my fury shall come up in my face. They're attacking the Jewish people which God promised Abraham and he would care for them. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, says God, have I spoken. I said I will care for them. Sure. Yes, the Mount of Olives will split. It will be a mighty earthquake. Other quotes in the Bible says that the day when the towers fall. You wouldn't want to be in central Adelaide or particularly central Singapore or somewhere like that where the towers are. He says the earthquake is going to be so great that many of those towers will fall. But look what he goes on to say. All the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, literally and mentally. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Wow. And I will call for a sword against him, against that Gogian confederacy, Throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. And so the great conflict takes place. And the final result, I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, 
and I'll rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Often with earthquakes we have volcanic consequences. But you know, come back a little bit. Look what he says, pestilence. That's used of disease and we're seeing that spread like no th- nothing with the coronavirus now. It looks like it will continue to then. But then he says, thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, all of the nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There will be the end. A great earthquake in the land and those armies coming into it, many of them will be destroyed. The consequences are huge. But now, most important for us, what will the kingdom be like? All of us want a place in that kingdom. We need to act quickly. Time is short. But what will it be like? The Bible says Jesus will be the future king. It says his kingdom will be worldwide. Yes, all nations will be judged who come to Jerusalem for war. And finally Christ will control the whole world. Thank goodness. Look at the chaos we see it today. Its capital will be Jerusalem. The faithful will rule with him. There's the invite to you. You can be part of it if we act now. Jerusalem will be the centre of worship. All nations will come up to Jerusalem to worship. All will go up from year to year to worship the king and the great God of heaven. And it will be a time of great blessing for all the people. Look at the madness of this world. Oh, don't we need this change? Change of great blessing. And the result? Worldwide peace. Look where we began. War after war after war. World War I, World War II, and a threat of a major war now in the Middle East. And we know it will happen. But in that time, it will be peace. It will be peace right throughout that kingdom period, which will last forever. Want to be part of it? Of course you do. Then we need to be acting on it now. Remember where Jesus was when he ascended into heaven? He stood upon the Mount of Olives and he went into heaven. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 16, it says this. And as he went into heaven, the angels came around the believers and said unto them, Go you into all the world, you apostles, and preach the gospel to every creature. Listen. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Very strong language. Oh, yes. But it's very clear. What do we need to do? One. The three essential steps stated at Christ's ascension into heaven at that time. Number one. Believe the gospel. The good news, as is spoken about in the scripture, the th- is defined as the things concerning the kingdom of God which we establish on this earth, not in some heaven, not as immortal souls, on this earth. The things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, that salvation is possible through the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. He can't be a part of the Trinity. He died and he rose again that we might be saved. We must believe that gospel. And we must then be baptised. That baptism is a total commitment to follow the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow in his ways. And then, continue faithfully until he comes. It can't be long away. I appeal to you, ladies and gentlemen, act soon. The time is short. We don't know how long we got. It might be a few years, but it doesn't look that way. Time is super short. And then, Be faithful until Christ returns. And so find a place in that glorious kingdom that is to be established. As we said, the days are super short. How long is it going to be? Russia is preparing to move. Europe is looking like it's coming under its control. But Christ, we believe, will return before the final conflict happens because he intervenes with the believers. It may be a few years before that final conflict, before the believers are gathered to Christ. 
But we know at the end, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And we pray that all of us here will find a place in that day, in that wonderful kingdom that is shortly to be established. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.